Also, just so you are aware, this webinar will be recorded and recordings will be hosted on our YouTube channel once the week concludes. So be sure to follow us there for easy access to these recordings again. Shortly, I will introduce our panelists, but first, I would like to give a special thanks to our sponsor of Field Inclusive Week, The Nature Conservancy. Thank you for coming on board as a sponsor beginning in the fall of 2022 and for being dedicated to promoting and supporting a more inclusive outdoors. It is through organizations like yours and the many individuals who donate to our organization that we can continue our mission and the goals in raising awareness when it comes to social field safety issues by hosting events like Field Inclusive Week, as well as providing financial support to marginalized and historically excluded individuals who professionally work outdoors. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Panelists, as I introduce each one of you, please feel free to turn on your cameras. Abby Turner, she, her, is a third year PhD candidate in the Evolution, Ecology, and Behavior Department at the University of Illinois, Illinois Urbana Campaign. Her research involves host brood parasite interactions. Her dissertation research focuses on different aspects of egg rejection behavior in the American robins. Abby strongly believes that field safety is crucial for researchers and is often overlooked. She is really excited to be a part of Field Inclusive Week. Jen Bai, he, him, is a PhD candidate in the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program at North Carolina State University, where he researches how historical and current anthropogenic and socioeconomic factors affect urban bird diversity. He is the project coordinator of a citizen science project, Triangle Bird Count, and a board member and community science committee chair of the New Hope Audubon Society. He also co-founded a nonprofit organization, City Bird, with the mission of documenting bird window collisions and advocating for bird deterrent films in the Triangle area. And last but not least, Murray Burgess, she, her, is an associate wildlife biologist, urban ecologist, and ornithologist who studies the effects of sensory pollutants on songbird health and development. She currently conducts a field experiment testing the impacts of light pollution on barn, barn swallow chicks. In addition to her research, Murray is an environmental educator and children's author. Murray started Field Inclusive based on her own experiences working in a rural, predominantly white area and her subsequent field safety activism. So a huge welcome and special thanks to all of our panelists today for agreeing to share their time and expertise with our audience members. Now, audience members, please feel free to submit questions for our panelists for the Q&A portion, which will be towards the end of our discussion today. Now, without further ado, I will pass it off to our first speaker, Abby, then we will hear from Jen, then Murray. So panelists, if you are not speaking, I ask that you go ahead and turn your cameras off until it is your turn. We will continue until everyone has gone, and then I will ask for you all to turn on your cameras for our Q&A portion, and we will all join together at the end for that. And again, just to reiterate for our audience members, as you listen to the conversation today, we invite you to please place your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar for our panelists to answer during the Q&A portion. All right, sound good? All right, take it away, Abby. I am going to now pass it off to you. Sounds good, thank you, Lauren. Um, um, I, I'm going to share my screen real quick so you can see me. Okay, so I, hold on just a second. I'm in a panel, so I have to, yeah, okay. If you go across the hall, there's um, should be some people in the office. Yeah, no worries. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, I just want to say thank you very much uh, to the organizers for having this. I'm really, really, really excited to be here because as you'll see, field safety is really important. So here's my email, here's my Twitter. Um, if you're interested, first, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on my research so you can understand where my field site is. Um, and as Lauren already mentioned, I study egg rejection in American robins. So egg rejection is a defense behavior against brood parasitism. So those who aren't aware, brood parasites lay their eggs in the nests of other species and uh, often incur a lot of costs um, on those hosts. And so egg rejection is a really neat behavior in defense of brood parasitism, and it can include many different forms, right? But um, American robins, 
Only a few small number of hosts perform these behaviors, but American robins are actually really good at rejecting uh, foreign eggs from their nests. So good that we have a review paper showing all the cues or not that robins use to um, reject foreign eggs from their nests. So my research kind of focuses on the hormonal mechanisms um, of egg rejection, specifically focusing in on the hormone corticosterone. So how does manipulating that hormone affect egg rejection rates? What is the natural corticosterone response uh, to foreign eggs? That sort of thing. So it's kind of one piece that I'm interested in. And then also some of these characteristics of egg rejection. So where does the female deposit the egg after she decides to reject it? Does individual personality influence these decisions in the birds? If not, what does? And how fast are these decisions made, basically? Uh, there we go. So this is you know, sort of what I'm looking into uh, with the robins here. But to kind of understand that, um, here. Ah, there we go. So where do I study all this, which is, comes important uh, for field safety, is a tree nursery in Urbana, Illinois. So it's semi-rural, 10 minutes from Walmart, so take that <laughs> as you will. Um, but hopefully these, these pictures can kind of give you the gist of uh, what that looks like. So it's basically just rows and rows of uh, immature trees. You can kind of see on the picture on the left, there's a big uh, road that divides the two um, parts of the nursery, basically. Uh, so we are visible to um, people who are driving by that road, but usually it's pretty quiet. So this is where I spend my entire field season. And uh, I've had some safety concerns in the past. Um, workers following me around in the field site, uh, which was, a bit frightening, I will say, as a woman, a woman of color walking alone. Um, but also the main one that really kind of spooked me, I guess. Um, and you can see the screenshot of the first Twitter thread that I have here uh, was when the police was called on us in the field. So I had um, my committee member and my field tech at the time who are both white males with me. So I say it all in the thread. If you're interested, you can go and read the thread. It's pinned on my Twitter. Um, so while I don't know if it was a racially motivated call, I don't know that. What I know is that it definitely scared the bejesus out of me <laughs> um, to have the police called on, the, called on me in the field and not really not know that they were called until they kind of just showed up. Um, I think what I learned from the thread was the most surprising thing to me. I'm out here in my field clothes, my field boots, my binoculars. It didn't occur to me that I could look a particular kind of way, um, suspicious, I guess. Um, it really didn't occur to me about that. I never once thought before I started grad school, what if the police gets called on me in the field, you know? never really crossed my mind um, until it happened. And then what do, what do you do? What do you say? Uh, thankfully, my committee member, I was very understandably scared. I really did not say much to the officer, actually. Um, my committee member who was there kind of took the reins on that. They said that they got the, the call was because we were, um, it looked like we were casing a house is what they said. And you cannot see it, but in this left picture also, there's one house <laughs> near this nursery, um, very much at the end. And I, they've seen me multiple times. They know who I am. I don't think they called the police either. Um, but I say all that because I think the biggest shock to me was that I didn't know this was a possibility. You know, for some reason, you know, outside of, of field work, this stuff happens all the time. Um, but for me, I don't know, for field work, I just didn't even think of that um, as being a possibility. So I think from the thread, I waited a whole year to post about it just because I, don't, I needed time to, to digest all of my feelings and thoughts on, on the matter. 
Um, and I posted this to this uh, thread, but as you can see, it, it reached a lot of a lot of people in science Twitter and outside of science Twitter, I guess. Um, and it was met by a lot of support, you know, but it was also met by some discouraging, um, you know, points of view, I guess. And so what I took out of this thread was kind of with the bad comments, I guess, that this is very much needed to have these conversations so that people can, you know, sort of understand that there are certain challenges that marginalized field researchers have to deal with. Um, and then I also took out some really, really good suggestions and some good nuggets of wisdom um, that I think can can really help people who might not have even thought about this before. Maybe your first year grad student have never thought about it. So I'd like to share those really, really quickly along with some Robin baby pictures, because why not? They're really, really cute. Um, so I think some good suggestions that I took away from, from sharing this uh, story on Twitter. So at the fieldwork le level, wearing your university or uh, whatever affiliation you have clothing. I got this suggestion a lot. I tried to do that in the field, but of course the one day I didn't have my Illinois hat on, you know, I didn't have an, an identifier on. Um, and, you know, I think that's important, right? That's a first step. You just have something that identifies you on. I also got a lot of suggestions for neon vests, which might work well for people who are in um, different scenarios. But when you're trying to catch robins, they really don't like to get caught. So making yourself stand out more probably uh, isn't going to work for me, but it might work for other people. Branded car magnets. This is one I'm excited about because I'm working with my department here at um, Illinois to get these for everyone who does field research and one for every side of the vehicle because we've had other grad students that have authorization to be places and uh, their car is not marked and so the public will wait for them and you know basically tell them they're not supposed to be doing that. Uh, so branded car magnets I think can be really helpful. Something that made me feel better, my PI, uh, my advisor contacted the local police station and will continue to. Uh, every field season since this happened, I think it's it's worth a shot, you know, to just let them know that your researcher is going to be in this area. And, you know, if they get any suspicious calls, at least they already kind of have information about that. And then permit packs, I would love to say, um, to carry around your permits, carry around your emergency info, carry around if you work on private land, you know, permissions or letters from uh, those people, just in case the police are called or any other authorities are called, you have your um, stuff handled, I guess. Um, so that's kind of like individual field work level, what can you do? And then at the lab department level, something that came about that I was very surprised on was that after this incident, you know, my university, my department, my lab even had no protocols for what to have what would happen uh, or what to do if somebody if the police were called if you break your leg in the field if you know whatever scenario these protocols don't exist and I find that really intriguing because they definitely should so I think at the lab department university level first we have to recognize that there's certain challenges um, that marginalized researchers in any group uh, may face and they may be different. And then how can we advocate that and put that into action? And I think the first step is at least every lab uh, should kind of have a protocol in place for, for what to do in these different scenarios, um, especially if they haven't happened yet. Unfortunately, there was no protocol or what to do if the police uh, were called when I started. That was actually my first field season as well that that happened. Um, but now there will be. And, you know, there ha there's giant tree holes that uh, you could break your leg in. I haven't broken my leg in the field, but what if I did? You know, so scenarios, especially if they haven't happened yet, I think um, are crucial. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm really happy to be here and answer any questions. Later. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So I'm going to share my screen. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Jim Bai. Um, so my presentation, I will talk a little bit about myself, my research, and some of the experience I had uh, dealing with field safety. And I hope through my experience, you can you can learn to not make the same mistakes. Uh, first about me, I did a master in wildlife ecology and conservation at the University of Florida. I'm a, currently a PhD candidate in fishery, wildlife and conservation biology at NC State University. I'm a co-founder of City Bird. If you're interested in uh, our organization, it's located in the, in the triangle. Uh, we're, we're trying to document bird window collation and advocate for uh, window films. I'm also the project coordinator of Triangle Bird Count and a board member of New Hope Audubon Society. So for my uh, research, when I was at UF, my research focused on bird behavior, uh, territorial defense, aggression. So I did a lot of playback experiments in the field. So that's my primary uh, field work. And that happens in either deciduous or uh, evergreen forest, uh, as well as in urban sites. Uh, and I currently study how the COVID-19 pandemic or the anthropos um, effect on urban birds and how neighborhood wells are connected with urban bird diversity, as well as uh, examining the ecological leg legacy effects of redlining in Durham, North Carolina. Um, so through the uh, safety issues that I have encountered, um, I have encountered a, a vehicle safety issues that it's, so as you can see on the picture, uh, that's when I was collecting data uh, when I was uh, in UF, that I got stuck in the mud. Um, as you can see on the left, there was a tree falling down and blocking the road, and I was just thinking I could take a detour and at the end I got stuck in the mud and that wasn't the, actually the, the only time I got stuck I also got stuck in the sand when there was um, a biolog biological station where the road are mostly sand I also got stuck so definitely an issue that you, you need to be aware of um, for me the solution for for the one showing in the picture was I contact someone from my department who is in charge of managing the vehicles, university vehicles. And he drive a truck that helped help me to pull, uh, pull out the car. Otherwise, I cannot deal with the issue myself. And for issue related to vehicle safety, I would say the strategy, the first would be either if you can avoid doing field work alone. I was doing the field work alone. Uh, if there's somebody else, uh, that person could help you push the car. Maybe you can get out of the mud. And before you're doing the field work, you should identify uh, any university staff that can help you if you have a problem so you know who to call. And you should also communicate frequently with your advisor about your field work schedule, especially. So in my case, I, I have the reception to call someone, but if your field work is in a really completely remote areas without reception, then you need to know, uh, you need to let people know in advance where uh, are you going and what is your plan. Another issue I encountered that um, I was actually got lost. Uh, so it was in the same field site uh, in a state park. I was collecting data and then suddenly I realized um, I forgot something from the previous point that I was collecting data. And I just naively think that it wasn't a far distance. I can just walk walk there. Uh, I just left my backpack, my phone, everything left behind to get the things I, I was trying to get. And it turns out to be a much longer distance. And because it was, I was in the forest, I was off trail, and there was so much understory, and it just I completely got lost. I couldn't get back to where I was. I don't have my phone with me. Uh, so it was somewhat scary, but I know that I, I can definitely find my way out. 
about 45 minutes to, uh, to an hour, I finally go back to where I was and uh, reclaim my bag and my phone. But it, this experience definitely um, tells me and anybody who is doing field work is always keep your phone with you all time. So that was definitely a mistake that I made. And, and, and especially if you uh, doing field work again in remote areas, you should download uh, things like offline Google Maps or whatever a digital maps that can be accessed without reception. So you, you can use that map uh, to navigate when you get lost. And the stop strategy I put on the slide are uh, from, um, from the internet. But basically, if you're really getting lost, uh, you need to stay calm, you need to think through how you got there, and any landmarks, a specific tree you remember, you pass by, and observe if there's ways you can go back. And if you really don't have a map, the last resort would be to follow the stream downhill uh, until you reach to somewhere uh, you can ask for help. And always think about the possible plan. And if, if, it's, uh, if it's about to nightfall, you might need to stay put until you get help. But those are in more extreme scenarios. But you can easily avoid all of that by having some GPS device or phone with you all the time. And another issue I encountered was insect hazards. So in the summer, when you're walking in, in grassland, there's uh, ticks could get on your pants and crawling on you. So that's definitely an issue you need to pay attention to. Um, I Before doing field work, my advisor definitely told me I need to check ticks whenever you come back from field work. So definitely wear long socks and pants and use insect repellent. And you can even track ticks throughout the day, throughout the, uh, the period of time when you are doing field work. Uh, there could be ticks, you can easily pick it out. And when you go home or return from the field, you should always track ticks thoroughly on your body if there are ticks. And there are definitely um, health hazards if they carry disease. And the last set of issues I had was interacting with locals. So locals, what I mean is local police and private property owners. So I have three experience in, in, in this uh, case. The first was that I was helping with someone who was doing uh, Bluebird next box monitoring. And, uh, and she got permission from a golf course manager that we can monitor the next box that are located on golf course property. But that day when I was uh, helping the, the project, uh, the one of the employee of the golf course was very mean and rude, just approaching me, saying things like, um, like I, I cannot afford to be here or like something like very mean, like to tell me to leave the property when we actually have permits and the permission from uh, the manager. Um, so that was definitely an, a very negative experience from just uh, a per very uh, personal uh, interaction. And another time while I was driving my research vehicle that has University of Florida um, like signs on the vehicle and that when I was driving towards to my study site, and there was uh, a truck so suddenly following me and keep giving me signals of uh, letting me to pull over. And I have no idea what is this about and uh, why would I pull over for uh, to someone who is not even the police. And eventually they just keep following me all the way to the gate of the state park that I collect my uh, uh, field research. and. And they told me that they are the private property owner of that piece of land in front of the gate of the state park. So this is a, a gate that is now the public entrance, but I was totally not aware that this belongs to someone and there was no sign of no trespassing or anything, but the whole tracing and following experience was definitely very uh, scary for me. 
And another time uh, when I was doing a community science project called Climbing Watch, where I uh, pull over uh, rows to count uh, brown hat and nut hatch. And then the, a police officer was passing by and saw me uh, pull over by, by the road. Uh, it's in a rural area of uh, Orange County, North Carolina. And the sheriff uh, pulled over uh, and st um, pull over his car behind my car, turned on the signal of the car. And I was just, I never encountered police that way before. And he eventually approached me and asked if there's anything wrong with my car. And I, I just calmly explained that I'm doing a climate watch project that I, um, that I was counting brown hat and nut hatch, that a species that is um, sensitive to climate change. So the project is to understand how the distribution of uh, brown hat and nut hatch change. So luckily for me, the police was very calm and understanding and um, it wasn't, it didn't raise any concern for, for him. And he even asked like what I, um, what I have observed for the project. So overall, it wasn't an active experience, but by uh, being pulled over by a police officer, just like uh, Abby said, was um, it's definitely somewhat uh, scary. Uh, although Abby was being called on police, I was more of a random encounter with the police. So I think for for this type of uh, issues, my strategy would be to inform the neighbors near your field site about you, about your research and your institution affiliations and always carry credentials and permits, um, wear university affiliate, uh, affiliate, affiliate, affiliated clothing and using university vehicle magnet. And whenever you feel unsafe, you should always contact your supervisor, advisor and modify the project plan if it's necessary. So in the end, my um, so the proposed framework of improving field safety, especially for marginalized identities, are uh, this figure summarized by um, uh, Ross et al. 2022 that they frame this as uh, things you can do before you go and prepare for the risk in the field, as well as when you return, always document uh, any interpersonal dangers and incidents and things that should be communicated with your supervisor. So I think um, for university, they can customize the training to be relevant to local risk and field ecologists should always complete training and prepare for risk in the field and always document encounter and dangers and report them to your supervisors. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Hey everyone, I am now going to share my screen to give my presentation. Um, my name is Murray Burgess and I am one of the co-founders and CEO of Field Inclusive. And I wanted to kind of discuss field safety as a pillar of diversity and inclusion within the natural sciences. So a little bit about me, I was always into animals and I loved going outdoors and like handling like all the frogs and the lizards. So I thought maybe I wanted to do herpetology or something like that. But throughout many like field experiences and classes through um, Mississippi State University, I learned that I really, really love birds. And so that's what I decided to focus on when going into grad school and doing my graduate studies at North Carolina State. Um, my current research um, focuses on the global issue of light pollution and how it affects um, songbird nestlings and my both um, internally and externally. And so my study species are barn swallows. And I always describe it as like, I run a little barn swallow doctor's office with me taking their measurements as they grow up and comparing how they're doing health-wise in the light versus in natural conditions. 
And so this work involves me driving about an hour or so away from where I live and going to this kind of remote, rural, predominantly white area. And I work in a barn for several hours, which is where the barn swallows nest. And I am usually out here by myself, um, focused on my work. And a one major part of my work is actually um, going out at night. Um, I have to go out at night on occasion so that I can um, check the lights, make sure everything's working properly, take a couple of like light measurements and just like see what's going on out there. And I think it's really cool experiment for me to be doing. But what was not so cool was starting in 2020 and seeing all of these safety concerns um, that I wasn't aware of before. Um, like I said, I was alone as a Black woman in the field in a rural, predominantly white area at night sometimes. And I began my first field season in um, 2020. And if you remember 2020, that was a year of high political unrest. I was constantly driving past um, Trump signs, Confederate flags. Um, I even drove past a like Confederate parade of some sort one day. And so the area where I was was just highly politicized and like made me feel very unsafe. Um, there were also unwelcoming areas surrounding the field site itself. The story that I always tell is that I was looking for housing so I could stay close to my field site and not have to drive an hour every time. But um, the places we checked out just seemed very unwilling to talk to me, some unwilling to like look me in the eye when I was asking them about staying there or like not really communicate with me which led to my decision to like just stay in Raleigh where I am and just go ahead and make that um, two hour round trip commute every single day to my barn. Um, and so for my safety, I have talked about this a lot, especially um, in an article I wrote for Walter Magazine. Um, I always carry knife, I carry my um, pepper spray and I always bring my dog Loki he is actually a big sweet teddy bear but at least he is kind of like an alert system for me in case there's somebody like coming up onto the property questioning why I'm being there and questioning you know what's happening with my research and so this has been like a really big issue that I encountered but of course we've just heard from like Abby and Jen and so many other people that I know in this field that this is an issue for a lot of people, which is why I want to kind of talk about some of the solutions and the purpose behind like starting field inclusive. Um, there are unique concerns for marginalized researchers um, and we've heard a lot of it here already, but discrimination from property owners or like other people who are like curious about what you're doing unnecessary attention from the police. Um, some people feel the need to like hide or mask your identities or health issues because you don't want to be the one causing problems or like rocking the boat. And you can also experience isolation or neglect from the department. Um, definitely a thing that's like not out of malice, usually something that's out of like not understanding that marginalized researchers have these issues. Um, if you don't know, you can't you don't know what you don't know, basically. And I'm again emphasizing that this is not only a race issue. There are many issues uh, from many people with different identities that could happen. Um, some of these common scenarios, it could be race, could be religion, it could be deal with your sexual or like gender expression, and it could also be through disabilities. And so all of these things that like departments probably don't like think about and probably don't have a lot of field safety policies in place that address these kinds of things. Most of the field safety policies that I've encountered only deal with like wildlife safety, safety on uh, poisonous snakes, venomous snakes, or um, tick removal and things. So some general solutions is to first just like have access to like identifying equipment. 
Um, we've talked about like car magnets. This is one of the things that I wanted to, that I got for myself during my first field season to kind of ward off some of those questioning glances and like hopefully not have people try to stop me or like call the police on me while I was outside. And that made me feel like really super better about the whole situation. In addition to that, like helping, always having any student who's out in the field having like a vest or an ID card or a hat, you know, something that identifies them as a field researcher. Um, second is going ahead and implementing some of these safety concerns and trainings with it on the department level for any faculty, staff, or students who are engaged with field work, there should be an online field safety course addressing some of these more interpersonal conflict issues. And finally, I have mentioned that like sometimes a marginalized researcher might not want to rock the boat or like be the issue within their lab. And so we urge um, advisors, and faculty and the people in charge to kind of reach out to your students and just like ask them what would make them feel more comfortable and to like continue to like support them and check out the field site with them, maybe help them communicate with the local property owners or local law enforcement just to kind of prevent some of these conflicts from happening in the first place. And to sum it all up, this is the purpose of Field Inclusive. We really want to support these marginalized researchers who are working in the field and also provide those resources for a field safety training, resources to help with their research and to help buy field safety gear and magnets for their department. And so that is kind of the summary of my presentation. And I am very much looking forward to you guys' questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Murray, and thank you so much to our panelists. These were all wonderful presentations, so I would like to thank you once again for your expertise. I now would like to invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on as we open it up to our audience by taking some of their questions already placed into the Q&A section. Again, audience members, if you have questions, please be sure to place them in the Q&A function and share that with us. All righty. So the first one that we have here, um, what kind of details, so Abby, I think this question is going to be for you. What kind of details does your lab or institution, um, like the standard operating uh, protocols, um, what does that include, you know, when you get the police called on you? What does that, what does your lab or institution usually do about that? Or how does that go about? Yeah. Um... Well, that's a good question. As far as the institution is concerned, uh, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any. <laughs> um, as far as my lab, um, that was the first time that um, that kind of happened since my advisor has been at Illinois, uh, at least. I'm not sure about uh, where he was before, actually. Um, and so we just kind of had to figure it out honestly I after it happened I didn't even think to tell my advisor um which you should definitely do <laughs> my committee member actually was the one who told Mark uh my advisor and from then my advisor reached out to me and we contacted our department head and um some other uh I'm forgetting the official titles but people who are in the office of um like student engagement and stuff like that to try and figure out what we can do to prevent it from happening in the future. But um, yeah, we had we had no no protocol. We kind of just figured it out <laughs> as it happened. But definitely tell someone if something happens to you, because honestly, I think I was shocked and I didn't even let my advisor know immediately. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. a huge mistake. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what, to follow up, if you don't mind me asking, what mm -hmm. sort of like advice would you give students, you know, when these situations arise? Because as you stated, you know, when they arise in like the, the present and you're going through that, that's, mm -hmm. you know, the last thing that you're thinking about is wanting to, you know, go to your advisor and tell them what happens. Because I know that there's, 
you know, for, for us students, especially when doing our research, we sort of fear that um, because, you know, we feel like, you know, our research might get compromised or, you know, we might have to alter things, you know, when it comes to our research and different things like that. So I guess what advice would you give students who might be um, a little bit more hesitant to go to their advisor, but like should, like you said, should do, you know, that right away? Should it just be something when they're ready, go to them? Or, you know, what would you say in regards to that? Yeah, I guess I would, um, you know, leave it up to their discretion in the, um, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll leave it up to their discretion in, in uh, that moment when it, you know, like for me, like there wasn't a gun pulled on me or anything, like simply the police came and it was a conversation. I was just very caught off guard and very afraid of that because there was very much a gun still visible and we all know what can happen um, when you're really not doing anything. So, you know, for me, I didn't create that Twitter thread until almost a year after it happened. I didn't tell the world, I didn't tell Twitter until a year after. So I think if it's a situation where your safety was like immediately put in harm, I would hope that you would feel comfortable to go to your PI, but if not, hopefully you have some other, a graduate student, a graduate student union, something of that that you can uh, utilize and um, your department had some other uh, resource, hopefully that you would feel comfortable with. Because I do think it's important that the university knows of the incident, um, even if you're you know, not fully recovered from it. So yeah. That would be my, my advice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next question here, and I will open it up to any of our panelists who would like to answer this. What would you advise in terms of preparation if you plan on visiting a site you have never visited before and might be unaware of potential hazards to prepare for? I think, um, so in a scenario, a lot of time, the study sites are, can be visited by other researchers in your department. So they may have been to the place. So you may gain some experience from other people who have used a study site. And if it's really a new study site that has never been visited or you don't know anyone who visited, I would say you should gather maybe a few people from the department, either staff or graduate students to assess risk together, just to scout the place together to see if there's pot potential risk and then determine from that. Uh, that would be my answer to that. Yep, echoing Jen, I was just gonna say, I was really appreciative of my advisor coming out to look at potential study sites with me and like talking also to potential housing owners with me. I thought that was very comfortable for me to not have to be the only one like, as the face of this project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, our next question. Um, well, actually it's more of a comment and this is, <laughs> so it says, um, this attendee says, I have been a field biologist for 20 plus years and have had lots of these experiences, but I'm seeing major failure from, from your department in regards to field safety training protocols and courses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is exactly where we here at Field Inclusive are trying to come in. And as Murray stated, you know, a lot of, you know, institutions and organizations, when they discuss field safety, it's about physical field safety. So identifying poisonous plants, dangerous animals, watching out for stump holes, you know, staying hydrated, all that stuff is usually what they go over. But we here at Field Inclusive want what we're calling social field safety. So interactions with, you know, the public, we want that to be raised to the same level as physical field safety. So while, while we do believe that physical field safety is important, uh, social field safety also needs to be taken into account as well. So I appreciate your comment. I think we can all agree <laughs> with that. <laughs> all right. Um, so next question here. Do you have any advice on how to make decisions in a group when faced with hazards in the field? For example, if we have hiked multiple miles away from our vehicles and a very active lightning storm blows in, but there are very few obvious safe places to get to, is there a best method of decision making under pressure like this?
I think this is a tough one. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, for me, I'm usually by myself or with um, my field tech. So there's only ever really uh, two of us and we're 10 minutes from where we live in Urbana. So um, I don't, I haven't experienced this. Um, but I think that's kind of maybe where the protocols come in. Like if there's inclement weather or if there's a storm, um, it's probably good that you're in a group because hearing some of Jen's stories being by yourself would, would be pretty scary. Um, but yeah, I think that's where just the protocols come in where you kind of just plan for anything that can, that can go wrong. And then you already have a plan and can kind of stick to that as, the, as a group. But that's kind of my two cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I think our other panelists agree with that, with that answer too. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Abby. Uh, this one is for Jen. So Jen, someone, uh, Caitlin wants to know where uh, we can find the risk per, uh, preparation infographic that you shared, because it was really, she says that it was really helpful. Yeah, I will put that in the chat, the title and the DOI of the link. Wonderful. All right, next question here. Any advice for how the suggestions reviewed today might apply when studying internationally? Okay, so this is actually a really, really great question. Not to not to jump in because I'm definitely not a panelist, um, but I will say that we here at Field Inclusive, we have realized that international students face a whole bunch of other things that we here in the US or you know, coming from the US, we just don't, we're, we just aren't aware of. And we're not going to sit here and play that we are. <laughs> so we are working to get some international perspectives, you know, on our board, you know, helping us out here with field inclusive so that they can bring that those sort of things and, you, you know, to the table. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see here. Um, and I just, I'm like kind of just panning through the questions here. So I'm not trying to go in order, but okay. So this one, how have you been able to navigate biases within the department or lack of support when you encounter biases? Hmm. That's interesting. For me, I have just learned to start saying what I need. Um, that's how I got the car magnets initially by talking to my advisor and my department head that there are safety issues going on here. Um, I know that can be like a hard thing to like speak up for just anybody, especially if you don't want to, if you're not confrontational or like you don't want to feel like you're rocking the boat. But um, I suggest just like being able to um, bring it up to somebody that is trusted within your department, if that's like your advisor or somebody else and like get them to help you talk to people and get what you need. Any of our other panels I, want to chime in on that? Yeah, go ahead, Abby. Yeah, I was just gonna say um, exactly what Murray said, but also you just have to be, it's so unfortunate, but you have to be persistent as well because they'll forget or it'll get put on the back burner or it's not as important to them because they've never had that experience and they don't have their identity and they're maybe not as concerned as you are. Mm -hmm. So I think as tiring as it can be sometimes, you have to be persistent as well. And just like Mary said, literally tell them what you need. Um, the most direct approach seems to be the best approach, I think, mm -hmm. when it comes to to handling those sorts of things. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so this one is very interesting. So this is to all of our panelists. Have you ever found identification on vehicles um, or you know, on your clothing um, to increase questions from the public? A previous workplace avoided visible identification to prevent having to explain constantly what we are doing and distract from the work that we are doing. That's interesting. I, know. I actually have that experience when it comes to my um, citizen science project, Triangle Bird Count. Mm -hmm. And I also participate in doing bird counts in primarily urban areas and neighborhoods. And I also have a vest, an orange vest saying NC State. 
it was recommended by one of my committee member. And once I started wearing them, doing bird counts, I just got more attention, <laughs> sort of unwanted attention, I think almost to a degree that because it's so obvious and people are curious what we're doing versus if I'm not wearing a vest, this is sometimes, I, I don't think it's a black and white situation, but in some scenarios that wearing a vest actually getting more attention that has mm -hmm. happened to me. Interesting to know. Thank you for sharing that, Jen. Um, and so Kayla Stoop, she is our field inclusive intern um, from NCSU. She had a few, um, she had a few remarks that she wanted to add. So go ahead, Kayla. Oh, that was actually for a question that we answered. Yeah, uh, go for it. Go for it. It was basically, I'll pull it up for the answered ones. Um, basically, like if there's a storm coming, what are some procedures to kind of help everyone get on the mm -hmm. same page? One thing that I know helps for sure is having an SOP, a standard operation procedure. So this is something that you do prior to going out every single day. Um, if, for example, I used to be an intern for a national park um, during kayaking and snorkeling programs, but before we went out, we checked the weather. So there was like a range between temperature, which was okay, and anything higher or lower that'd be like a check mark. So just doing a standard operation procedure. And if you have too many, um, I guess, nuances or anything that might pose a potential threat, then you guys can make decisions from there. So definitely a documented standard operational procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Kayla. Um, okay, so this will be our last question before I leave off with a comment. And then I'm going to ask for some final thoughts from our panelists. So um, I feel like you all should be able to provide your input on this one, but how do you feel about field safety being a required course for graduate students? I dig it. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think like those things that happened in my first field season, it was my very first field season of my PhD. Like I, those things were not on my radar at all. Like I think the field safety that from the experiences I had before being a field tech and an undergrad, um, I think it's a lot, I forget who said it, but someone said it's very much focused, the safety part is focused around the wildlife and not you. And, you know, you just kind of come in with that mindset. And I think, especially for students coming in, you know, who might not know that some students have had these experiences, um, I think it could only be beneficial especially people who've never done field work before, so. I would totally agree on uh, that too. And especially, I feel like the best advice are from people who have done similar field works and have the experience and they can sort of alert you ahead what could happen. Mm -hmm. So that if the course is somewhat interactive with maybe people from the department who has experience and who can talk about the, uh, their advice will be really helpful. Right. For sure, for sure. And then to go off of that one also, can field safety be a required course for faculty advisors too? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should be, especially those who have students who are doing the field work. Yeah, everybody yeah. should be involved in the safety protocols. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, panelists, I want to um, end the Q&A portion by saying that we had a ton of people in the chat saying thank you so much for your presentations. They were very relevant. They helped them out a lot. So we do, again, appreciate your expertise on this topic of field safety. So um, we are at 455. So I'm going to leave a few minutes to ask you all for your final thoughts, if you have any. So I'm just going to go in order of how I see you on my screen. So Murray, I see you first. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience members today? Yeah, my final thoughts is just just because it might not apply to you doesn't mean that you should ignore the issue. So just be mindful of like people on your team, people in your department who might have these needs and just communicate with them. Always ask them what they need and try to get everyone's needs met as best as you can. Um, also, my um, social media and emails are open if anybody has any un unanswered questions they wanna contact me about. 
um, you can send it to me anytime or to Feel Inclusive's email. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abby, you were next. Thank you, Murray. Awesome. I'm like, hmm, final thoughts, final thoughts. Um, <laughs> no pressure, no I pressure. I, <laughs> yeah. I guess um, I just thank you everybody for, you know, listening because these are very real experiences that we have and they kind of, at least for me, have tainted a little bit my field season's following because, you know, looking over my shoulder, I'm feeling uneasy, you know, and that kind of distracts from the work that you're trying to do and enjoy, you know, because hopefully you enjoy it. Um, and I just, I would just challenge everyone just to, to look at, do you have a, a field safety protocol for your lab or your department or your university level? Uh, for field researchers? And do you have a plan for things that haven't happened yet? Think about it. And if not, you know, we can start thinking together. How do we create these protocols? What should be included? You know, we've got good community and resources around this topic. So mm -hmm. thanks for listening. Yes. Great final thoughts, Abby. Thank you. And Jen, any final thoughts from you? Yeah. So for me, the final thought would be to speak up like no matter what your experience you may think is a, such a small thing or maybe as long as the 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 thing the issue that you experience make you feel unsafe make you feel scared make you feel those feelings you should speak up that could be a potential issue and it, it, it can be shared with uh, a lot of other field researchers who may have the same issue so mm -hmm. always speak up always talk to your advisor about those issues and advocate for uh, any changes in terms of like training or uh, protocols. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, we here at Field Inclusive would like to thank Abby Turner, Jim Bai, and Murray Burgess for joining us today. And again, we thank you for the work that you are doing and continue to do when it comes to educating others about social field safety and sharing your experiences. Again, we thank those who joined us today. We will continue these conversations as we further our initiatives and work when it comes to amplifying social field safety issues. Please be sure to follow and interact with us on all of our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at our handle, Field Inclusive. Please also be sure to visit our website to learn more about our organization and ways that you as an individual or organization can support us. Be sure to check out the rest of our virtual Field Inclusive Week events. So tomorrow at 4 p.m., we will have Sue Um, registered dietitian at NC State Campus Health Services, who will be discussing challenging stereotypes, what should a field biologist look like? So we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. And as Murray stated, if you have any questions that did not get answered by our panelists today, please feel free to email those to our email, uh, fieldinclusive at gmail.com. All right. Again, thank you all for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone.